Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tucker Carlson Tonight. As you know, I'm not Tucker. I'm Brian Kilmeade, lucky enough to fill in for Tucker, and here we go. Actor Jesse Smollett said he was the victim of a savage, racist, homophobic attack. Now his story seems to be, let us say, unraveling, and the entire attack may turn out to be a stunt, may turn out to be a stunt, arranged by the actor himself. We'll have all of that soon, right from Chicago. Plus an appearance on this show by Tucker himself. Don't ask me how we pulled that off. But first, President Trump has pulled the trigger, declaring a national state of emergency on the southern border in order to fund and build a wall and other things. How did it happen and how will the emergency work? Washington correspondent Kristen Fisher is all around the madness, and she's here to unwind it all for us. Kristen. Hey, Brian. Well, this emergency declaration is only a few hours old, but already the ACLU says that it will sue President Trump, and the House Judiciary Committee has launched an investigation. Democrats on the committee sent a letter to President Trump tonight saying that we believe your declaration of an emergency shows a reckless disregard for the separation of powers and your own responsibilities under our constitutional system. By fabricating an emergency order to bypass the political process for allocating a budget, you appear to be abusing both this trust and your own oath of office. But President Trump predicted all of that when he announced the emergency declaration in the Rose Garden earlier today. The order is signed, and uh, I'll sign the final papers, and we will then be sued, and they will sue us in the Ninth Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there, and we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake, and we'll win in the Supreme Court. Now, the declaration will give President Trump about $8 billion to build his border wall. The White House says its attorneys have spent weeks going through the ins and outs of an emergency declaration to ensure that President Trump is on solid ground, and they believe he is. But some Republicans believe it's an abuse of executive power and could set a bad precedent. So this is going to be hashed out in court and in Congress for quite some time. But at least Washington has avoided another government shutdown. Brian, that was set to start in just about four hours if they hadn't reached a deal. Right. Brian? And I just love the way the president went through that because he basically outlined what we're going to be covering and how we're going to be covering it over the next year or so. Kristen, thanks so much. He did. Thanks. Uh, all right. Meanwhile, the president vowed that his national emergency will get the job done and halt the decades-long crisis at the border. We're going to be signing today and registering national emergency because we have an invasion of drugs, invasion of gangs, invasion of people, and it's unacceptable. So we have a chance of getting close to $8 billion, whether it's $8 billion or $2 billion or $1.5 billion, it's going to build a lot of wall. We're getting it done. Well, he got a green light for at least 55 miles of wall, and then we'll see about the $8 billion. He'll get you a lot more. But CNN's Jim Acosta accused the president of conjuring up a broken border crisis out of thin air. Let me just ask you this. What do you say to your critics who say that you are creating a national emergency, that you're concocting a national emergency here in order to get your wall? I, I you asked the angel moms, ways. what do you think? Do you think I'm creating something? Ask these incredible women who lost their daughters and their sons. Okay. They were there with pictures of their loved ones. What an answer. What a comeback. Why does the president keep calling on him? Well, that's the consensus. The media and of the left, despite millions of illegal immigrants, despite the mess of the border, they think the president made it up. And our border is just fine. The president of the United States is going to declare a national emergency on our southern border. But I have to tell you, it doesn't look like an emergency from where I'm standing. It's not an emergency, what's happening at the border. A national emergency to solve his manufactured crisis. We don't have a national emergency. That's just not true. There is no national emergency. There is no national emergency. Right. There's just simply no emergency there. What are we, stupid? A manufactured emergency. Really? Uh, well, the Migration Policy Institute estimates that 827,000 of the 11 million here illegally are convicted criminals. That's a total of 7%. Not 1% should be in the country. Mark Morgan is a former head of the Border Patrol, and he's heard the rhetoric, but he knows the reality. Mark, is the president making up an emergency? Absolutely not. And, Brian, this is the part of the frustration for those of us from a law enforcement, border security perspective. How many more statistics do we have to provide? How many more factually based examples do we have to provide? How many more angel families 
have to stand in front of some of these individuals before they finally say, yeah, okay, this is real. It, it's, it's just incredulous. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's true. And the other thing I thought about, too, Mark, and because I know you served during the Obama years, there was an emergency then. They chose not to act on it. It doesn't mean there's not one now, and it doesn't mean they're not getting worse. I mean, the numbers this year show a huge uh, uh, uptick in apprehensions. That doesn't count the people we don't catch. So when people say to you, uh, the drugs are coming through the port of entry, let's use some technology to crack down there, there's no problem with drugs in the middle of, uh, of the country and other areas not populated, what do you say? Well, that's right. And a couple of things you hit on, Brian, and you're spot on. So first of all, look at the take right now. 60,000 are coming in a month illegally into this country. So this year so far, 62 caravans of 100 or more, 13 of all of last year, 2,000 in one single day uh, th this week. And so the numbers are, are, are climbing, but it's manufactured, right? And the other thing, the other argument on, on in between the ports of entry, it's a absolute false narrative. 60% of the Southwest border does not have enough infrastructure, technology, and personnel. I call that wide open. So they're, they're disingenuous when they talk about the ports because we don't, Brian, just what you said, we don't know what's getting through, but we do know that it is getting through, and there's a lot that we're not interdicting in between the ports. So, you know, it's just amazing, too, because not only do most Democrats not agree, there's a new trend, and mark my words, it's going to be happening all week. Instead of build the wall, take down the fence. That's going to be the method. As a person who's out there trying to defend our border, what does that mean to you? Again, what, what it means to me is that this is absolutely driven on identity politics. The experts have spoken both on ICE, both on the United States Border Patrol and CBP, and they've told Congress what they need to protect our borders to, for the security and safety of this country, Brian. And they have not just ignored it. They have just absolutely discounted everything that they've said. And unfortunately, to me, I, I've only drawn one conclusion. It's based on ident right. identity politics. And I just asked for the, the latest, that's why I was looking down, the latest uh, news about January. And so far in January, apprehensions have risen up. There were 58,207 apprehensions in January. Uh, that's the highest it's been over the past uh, five years. And those are the people, as you always tell us, that you get. What about the ones we don't know about? And I Absolutely. just talked to somebody else who just went down to the border because uh, they're serving in the military. And they say some of the techniques that these people crossing are using mirror the military techniques that they've seen in battle. That's what's happening in Arizona. So I'll share more of those stories. Mark, thanks for your up close and personal, unbiased look at what's happening at the border. We'll see where we go from here. Thanks, Meanwhile, Brian. eight minutes after the top of the hour, while President Trump seeks to build a wall, some Democrats think walls are so evil, as I said before, they want to start an anti-wall jihad. Potential presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke said he wants to eliminate whatever defenses are on the Mexican border, in this case, Texas. If you could, would you take the wall down now, here? Yes. Like you have a wall. Absolutely. Like knock it down. I'd take the wall and down. Do you think the city, you think if, this, if there's a referendum here in this city, that would pass? I do. Right. And then ask that question and then run back to New York. Kristen Gillibrand always looking for a new cause to jump on the bandwagon. She might think her ratings might tick up a little bit. She chimed in, and guess what she said? The idea of dismantling some of the wall, good idea, bad idea? Well, I'd have to ask uh, folks in that part of the, uh, of the country to see whether the fencing that exists today is helpful or unhelpful. So I could look at it and see which part he means and why, and if it makes sense, I could support it. If you've been in Washington this long and haven't asked anybody who works the border if a fence helps or not, you're not doing your job. Chris Hahn is a radio host, former staffer to Senator Chuck Schumer, joins us now. Uh, first off, Chris, your reaction to the president's using emergency powers? Completely unconstitutional. I expect all these Federalist Society guys for the last 100 years talking about strict construction of the United States Constitution. Article 1, Section 5, 6, and 7 tells who gets to decide where money is spent. Whether you think the wall is necessary or not, the president needs to convince Congress to do this. And if Congress does not stand up to the president, I don't know why they are there. Are they there for the for the state-run offices and the fancy pins? Their job is for their ambition 
ambition to counteract the president's ambition, and it is their job mm -hmm. as members of Congress to determine where money is spent. And if you are in Congress and worried about being primaried on this issue, maybe you should step down from your leadership position and let somebody with courage to actually do the job of a member of Congress take the reins of that spot and do the job appropriately. This is Chris, completely unconstitutional. Let me give you we a scenario. Down nine nothing I empower by the Supreme Chris Court. Hahn. I empower Chris Hahn as president of the United States or somebody in that area, governor of Texas, Arizona, and you see a legitimate yep. problem at the border and no one else, uh, then politics is keeping you from backing up the border and keeping the people safe that you were elected to do. You would do anything you could to protect your family, your constituents. That's exactly what the president's doing. And thanks to a 1976 yeah. ruling, he's got the executive power to do it. <laughs> and he says, if you have a problem with it, take me to court. What's wrong with that? Well, well, look, emergencies don't, you don't get to choose emergencies. Emergencies choose you. This president's been waiting on an emergency for two years. Congress didn't see the emergency. If Congress thought this was an emergency when we were debating this over the last 45 days, they would have given him the funding for this. He couldn't convince Congress that there was an emergency, so there must not be an emergency. Plus, border crossings are at a 50-year low, so I don't understand what he's worried about. What is the fear that he's trying to generate? I'll tell you where the emergency is, Brian. Right, Chris, let me just get a word in. It's, just, base, it's, really, not at, in it's really not at a low. Because I, I, they're at a high. In fact, in January, apprehensions were 58,207, the most over the past five years. And CBP announced that agents in the Rio Grande Valley apprehended 1,300 people on Wednesday. Uh, Come on. I'm using the president's own statistics from 2018, from his own government. These are the, pr the president's hey, statistics. They're at a 50-year low. And the president uh, uh, even hey, Chris, admitted I that appreciate, today I appreciate your passion. Conference. But I think you should ask yourself why President Obama wasn't taking more of an urgency, uh, less than you should ask you why is President Trump doing it this now. Is, this is not about President Obama. This is about the President of the United States violating right. the Constitution well, of the United States. We're going to see. I don't care He's what got $8 billion, he and all he wants to he, do is spend it, it to keep be, it Chris on safe down. on Long Island. That's all. Chris, <laughs> thanks so much. We want to keep MS-13 out of your neighborhood because we know it's miles away from my house and your house. Meanwhile, Tucker is back after the break. President Trump's re-election odds, by the way, look kind of dicey for some, but could he be getting a big boost from Democratic radicalism? That story debated next. All right, welcome back to Tucker Carlson Tonight. I'm still Brian Kilmeade, and I'm still filling in for Tucker. But Tucker was talking to Mark Stein and Larry Elder just a short time ago, and we taped it. Watch. Amazingly, the 2020 election cycle is in full swing at this point. Virtually every notable Democrat really in the world has already jumped in. President Trump looked vulnerable a couple of months ago, maybe even doomed to defeat. And that was, of course, the lure that got them into the race. But things have changed a lot in the last two months. The Democratic Party's own wokeness has been the real factor. Watch. An agency like ICE which repeatedly and systematically violates human rights, does not deserve a dime. This administration and this president are truly morally corrupt. When your son looks at you and says, Mama, look, you won, bullies don't win. And I no. said, baby, they don't, because we're going to go in there and we're going to impeach them. <laughs> So what would happen if the least balanced, most extreme members of the Democratic Party took over? <laughs> well, the president couldn't have scripted better. He may not have built a wall in the end, but his enemies are so terrifying to normal voters that it's helped him. His approval rating is rising. His reflection odds have improved as well. Author and columnist Mark Stein has been watching all this and joins us tonight. So I'm starting to think that maybe Alexand Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and this Elon Omar are working for the Trump organization in some <laughs> capacity. I mean, it almost seems like a setup. It's, it's just almost too perfect. Yeah, I think they're colluding with Trump, as we should say, um, and, and we need to investigate it. Um, yeah, I, uh, basically, what is going to happen now is that the the trajectory in the in the Democrat side of the field is that they're all going to they're all going to drive each other even more woke. So you'll think that uh, Elizabeth Warren is woke, and she'll make Kamala Harris even more woke, and in the end, they'll even succeed in woke. 
woking Joe Biden, and they're all going to be made super hyper woke. Federal officials, policemen in effect, have discussed uh, using the 25th Amendment because they think uh, President Trump is mentally ill. And as Alan Dershowitz said, that's a judgment that uh, should be made by doctors or secretaries or chiefs of staff, anyone in fact, but a police agency. Um, and uh, the, the question before the electorate is going to be who is really the sane or the insane one? Yeah. The party that is proposing retrofitting every single 230-year-old colonial-era farmhouse uh, in, uh, in northern New England in order to make it compatible with the Green New Deal, the party that is committed to abolishing the border enforcement agency, uh, or the guy who's just there in the White House doing his job, uh, even as he drives deep state lunatics uh, to devise ever more absurd ways of trying to get rid of him. So you got to wonder if there aren't big parts of the Democratic Party, even the Democratic Party, who are going to look at people like this screaming on CNN all day and think, you know what, uh, this is too much for me. I mean, they could potentially yeah. break their party in half. Yes, I think so, because if you, if you uh, look at what happened last time, they had a problematic and frankly, rather unlikable candidate proposing yeah. uh, proposing uh, relatively centrist uh, or, or left of center policies in Democrat terms. This time round, you are going to have candidates who uh, are taking extreme leftist positions. And the risk, of course, is as with what happened to Ilan Omar. Uh, that in, in crude identity politics terms, they check all the boxes, they do all the virtue signaling, so they seem kind of nice. And then you read three or four of their tweets and you realize, actually, this person isn't nice. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a real danger for the Democrats. Whereas uh, Trump, by comparison, plays a sort of a uh, thug and a bully, and he tweets up a storm. But he's actually not uh, unlikable in the same way that some of these Democrats are revealing. Well, and themselves. his policies are basically moderate, which nobody ever says, but it's true. Yeah, no, no, that's, yeah. that's absolutely right. Yeah. He's relatively Mark. centrist on that stuff. For sure, by the standards of two years ago, anyway. Mark Stein, thank yeah, you yeah. very much for that. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Tucker. Well, here's an update to a story we spent a lot of time talking about. The U.S. news media, as you remember, immediately sees the chance to brand a group of high school boys from a Catholic school in Kentucky, Covington, as villains, bigots who are targeting people on the basis of skin color. Well, it soon emerged that not only wasn't true, it was the opposite of what happened, but it didn't matter. Journalists continued to use their power to browbeat and bully the high school kids. Here's one among many examples. Do you feel from this experience that you owe anybody an apology? Do you see your own fault? We looked at that video and thought about how it felt from the, the other's perspective. In other words, there were a lot of you, a handful of the others. There's something aggressive about standing there, standing your ground. Something aggressive about standing there. And journalists weren't the only ones to make that point. The Covington students' own Catholic bishop condemned them as well. Now, that bishop has apologized for what he said. He's admitted that he was bullied into denouncing the boys and that he never even looked at the evidence about what they did. Larry Elder's radio show host from Los Angeles. We're always happy to have him on the show. He joins us tonight. So, Larry, you got to think, not just in the case of these boys, but in the case of anyone who's been called names by the media collectively and then found to be not guilty of the charges, how does that person get his reputation back? Well, of course, the person doesn't get the reputation back. The accusation is made above the fold, page one. The retraction uh, is made uh, deeper into the newspaper. Yeah. What happened here is what I call the intersection of Trump derangement syndrome and what Tom Wolfe, the author who wrote the book Bonfire the Vanities, calls the media's incessant search for the great white defendant. Nothing better for the media than a white man who's perceived as privileged that they can malign. And that's what happened with Mr. Nick Sandman. And later on, uh, this earlier this week, uh, uh, Tucker, 
Parker. It also happened to a friend of mine named Doug Atler, who used to be an ESPN commentator. Two years ago, did a match uh, involving Serena uh, Venus Williams. Used the term guerrilla tactics, not G O R I L L A, but guerrilla as in guerrilla tactics. And yeah. a, a New York Times uh, tennis writer named Ben Rothenberg puts out a post and accuses um, Doug Adler of racism. ESPN demands that he apologize. Adler happens to be white. Uh, and he does to keep his job. They still fired him. And for two years, he's been battling a defamation lawsuit. Finally, he won it, got his job back. But the uh, tennis uh, uh, sports writer at New York Times uh, has not lost his job, nor has he apologized. Wait, wait, nor did I'm... anybody in the tennis commentating field uh, come to Doug Adler's rescue. Not the um, McEnroe brothers, uh, not uh, uh, Martina Navratilova. None of these announcers said guerrilla tactic is a normal term used to describe a tactic in a match. And he got fired, got maligned as a as a racist, just like Nick Sandman got maligned as a racist before the facts came in. The intersection of Trump derangement syndrome and the incessant search for the great white defendant. Well, that's a shocking story. Gorilla spelled G-U-E, the French yeah. word. Not, nothing right. to do with the primate at all. It's a completely different word. Nothing. And he gets and, fired. And Tucker, and when, when, he, when ESPN approached him, he said what you said. He said, I didn't say gorilla as an animal. I said gorilla as in tactic. And they still fired him after he apologized. My goodness. Talk about hysteria. This is mass hysteria. It fit the script. This young man uh, in D.C. was wearing the mega cap. He committed also the sin of being born white. Uh, and uh, he was privileged. And so the media just ran with that, just as they ran with the story about Doug Adler. It's outrageous. And nobody <laughs> stood up to defend him. They were all Nobody cowards. Did. They just I'm looked sorry, at their one, shoes. One tennis commentator did, named Rami Koenig. He is a South African commentator. Good Outside of that, nobody did. And Venus Williams could have stopped this in five seconds. I know she's busy, but my goodness, she could have stopped it in five seconds had she wanted to. Instead, she wouldn't comment. She just let him twist in the wind. And wreck the man's life and reputation. Right. And, and by the way, Tucker, he had a heart attack. His cardiologist said his, his heart was fine before the stress of being called an international racist for two years. And now he's gotten his job back with a settlement, but no apology. <laughs> you know, there really aren't many brave people left, which is part of the problem. You are definitely one of them. Larry Elder. Well, thank Again, you, it's always, always a blessing to have you on the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Great conversation. Meanwhile, straight ahead, Andrew McCabe now admits the Department of Justice considered bureaucratically overthrowing the Trump administration and tossing the president out. That story's next. They want to amend some of it. We also have breaking news on the Jesse Smollett investigation, plus more of Tucker, who's never been better. All right, in a soon to be released, Blockbuster 60 Minutes interview set to air this Sunday. Fired FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe said that the DOJ seriously considered an effort to have their bureaucracy remove President Trump from office. CBS's Scott Pelley explained on Thursday what McCabe told him and will hear Sunday. There were meetings at the Justice Department in which it was discussed whether the vice president and a majority of the cabinet could be brought together to remove the president of the United States under the 25th Amendment. The deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, offered to wear a wire. A statement was released after that 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 was never serious, it was sarcastic, etc. McCabe, in our interview, says no. It came up more than once, and it was so serious that he took it to the lawyers at the FBI to discuss it. Wow. Uh, now, through uh, now, though Andrew McCabe is trying to walk back those comments to a degree, claiming his 25th Amendment talk was taken out of context. Dan Bongino not buying it. He's a former Secret Service agent and the author of Spygate, the attempted sabotage of Donald J. Trump, joins us now. Dan, interesting. Does Andy McCabe think we don't remember the last time we saw him and that's being fired because he lied? Yeah, he definitely has a credibility problem, Brian. I mean, according to multiple reports out there, for anyone to see on the Internet, he's being investigated by a grand jury uh, for lying about leaks to the media. He has a serious credibility problem. Keep in mind also, Brian, this is the same guy whose wife ran for office as a Democrat, took substantial money yep. from people connected to the Democrat and Clinton machine, and then refused to recuse himself from that case investigating Mrs. Clinton until the end of the year. But, Brian, the most important takeaway from all this is, of course, Andy McCabe's trying to walk this back. This guy, he's not that bright. He just admitted in a 60 Minutes interview, according to Scott Pelley, to taking part in a coup attempt. 
Right. That, that, that's just the hard facts. There's no way he's going to weasel his way out of this. Well, Scott Pelley summarized what he said, so we'll see Sunday. But this is the walk back. You ready for this? He was present and participated in a discussion that included a comment by Deputy Director Rod Rosenstein, uh, Attorney General, uh, regarding the 25th Amendment. So he's saying it wasn't a big meeting. It was just mentioned once. Rosenstein yeah. came out and said, yeah, I said I'll overthrow the president, but I said it sarcastically. I'd wear a wire. I don't like either one of these either side of this conversation. Yeah, I don't know about you, Brian, but when I go to dinner with my friends, I don't just casually bring up like, hey, you want to go rob a bank? Oh, don't worry. I was just kidding. Like, right. there's some things as the deputy uh, deputy director of the FBI. Let me just give him like a pro tip, right? It's probably not a good idea from a former federal agent. Granted, I wasn't the deputy director of the Secret Service, but probably not a good idea to hit the 25th Amendment. In other words, removing a president from office for an obviously nonsensical reason, some physical incapacitation. This guy, Brian, make no mistake. He was operate. It was a. This was the discussion of a soft coup. There is no other way around this. He didn't. I don't know if he's just not that bright. And he said this to Scott Pelley, not realizing what he was admitting to. But it's clear to me now that Rosenstein and him have a lot of culpability in this. Rosenstein with the FISA, McCabe admitting, by the way, on the record that the case wouldn't have existed without the dossier. And they're both essentially two guys who have culpability sitting in two separate rooms being interviewed by law enforcement who are trying to be the first to rat on each other to get the best deal. And he admitted he started an obstruction of justice probe before Robert Mueller was even in the picture, and he did it to make sure the counterintelligence operation wasn't shelved with his firing after Comey was fired. Really? So to stop a counter... You were fearful of a counterintelligence oper uh, investigation stopping, so you started an obstruction of justice, and then you got fired anyway. Um, my head's spinning... But all I know is this president's being hampered by an investigation that just won't go away. Dan, yeah. I, I want to talk to you Monday after we see the entire thing. Is that all right? Yeah, you know, listen, Brian, of all the players in this, McCabe is, the, I believe, the one with the most culpability. Remember, he was involved in the Clinton investigation and the Crossfire Hurricane one, and he's got that issue with his wife running for office, right. too. He's got a lot of culpability here. Big trouble for McCabe. This is why Dan Bongino is one of the best people to talk to about this case. Dan, thanks hey, so thanks, much. Buddy. I appreciate all right. that. And now you have a great weekend. Uh, meanwhile, coming up uh, now, actually, we're not going to take a break. I want to go to this story right now. A surprise development happened just as we were walking into the studio. Former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick has settled his lawsuit with the National Football League. Kaepernick sued the league last year, claiming 32 teams colluded to keep him off the NFL roster because he was taking a knee during the national anthem. Now, we don't know many details about the settlement, but Kaepernick had previously signaled that only a lucrative financial payout will convince him to drop the suit. What does this mean, and what does it mean for Kaepernick's future? He's 31 years old. You would have to think he could still play if he wants. Fox News contributor, if she used to be at ESPN, where she thrived there, Britt McHenry with a rich uh, sports background. Britt, Michael Freeman, a respected NFL reporter, is reporting, get this, that he's getting $60 million. What does that tell you? It tells me, Brian, that money will make a problem go away or it will make a social justice warrior really happy and really rich. But I have to tell you, I did a little reporting on my own. I reached out to an NFL source of mine, an NFL agent, who said he would be shocked if that was the number. He expects it to be much lower than that. Of course, Kaepernick's attorney might might be the one leaking this because they want to set a precedent for future cases. But it really makes me scratch my head because you have to factor in. It's not just Colin Kaepernick. It's Eric Reed who just signed Brian with Carolina. A Three-year deal, yes, with the Carolina Panthers for $22 million. He only missed four games this season, and I was told the reason that he wasn't on a team at the start of the season was because, hey, he just wasn't as good as he thought he was. Now, as far as Colin Kaepernick goes, this is just him selling out, getting the money that he wants. It's confidential, but, so we may never really know. And he made a million dollars on a book deal advance. You know, he's in Nike more headlines. Ad. He has gotten more publicity, more attention, right. and I would argue more money by doing Brit. this than what he would have been, a backup QB. But if he did get uh, $60 million, mm -hmm. uh, as Michael Freeman's reporting, or anything close to that, it shows that he was right. Why would the NFL settle this if there wasn't collusion? I think I have to suspend disbelief to think that 32 teams would decide not to hire a quarterback they thought he could help with, that they could help win. I can't believe this collusion would happen, but I'm left to that conclu uh, conclusion if that money is correct. Well, we saw the commissioner, Roger Goodell, answer questions at the Super Bowl media week and was very uncomfortable. This is to make it go away. They want this problem to go gotcha. away, and that's essentially what they got. Uh, Britt McHenry, thanks so much.
Thank you. I'll continue to watch on Fox Nation and everywhere else. Meanwhile, Tucker's back after the break. This time with the final exam, can you do better than the great Lauren Blanchard as she goes for her eighth win in a row? Many didn't think it was possible. Now you can take a wide shot. All right, welcome back to Tucker Carlson tonight. Here is Tucker now with this week's edition of the final exam. Oh, a break in the clouds, a respite from the news. It's time for Final Exam, where we pit news professionals against one another to see who's been paying the closest attention to what's happening in our country this week. Our defending champion once again is Fox correspondent Lauren Blanchard. No fewer than seven opponents have been buried by Blanchard, two below the all-time record. Her latest challenge is Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel, who, like Lauren Blanchard, is beloved in this bureau here in Washington. I'm not sure if it's a fair matchup or unfair. <laughs> Breathe through your nose trying to establish calm. Thank you. You brought me in to be slaughtered. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm sure you'll do great. Now, I know you both know the news, rather the rules, but I'm going to repeat them for those just tuning in. Hands on buzzers. I ask the questions. The first one to buzz gets to answer the question. You have to wait till I finish asking before you answer. You can answer once I acknowledge you by saying your name. Every correct answer is worth a single point. If you get one wrong, you lose a point. Best of five wins. Are you ready? I hope so. Sure. <laughs> you, you look so resigned. <laughs> I think you can do this. I, Mike Maynard, I'm, I think you can. Okay, question one. In a new yeah. interview, which 2020 hopeful said that marijuana legalization would be good since it gives, quote, a lot of people joy? Lauren Blanchard. It's Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. Did Kamala Harris say weed brings joy? I believe we need to legalize marijuana. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. I can and I, and I inhale. I did, in, I did, did inhale. inhale. <laughs> Listen, I think that it gives a lot of people joy, and we need more <laughs> joy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doesn't make the population sad or passive or anything. But you knew the answer. Yes. You were you, not, you're probably you, not a weed smoker if you knew that. Uh, did you also hear what she listened to? No. She said she listened to Tupac and Snoop Dogg, wow. but they hadn't released albums yet. She's very cool. <laughs> well, she had the advanced copies, clearly, yeah. when you're that cool. Question two. This is a multiple choice question, so wait till I finish oh, asking oh, before boy. you answer. At his rally on Monday night, the president said that people often tell him if he wants to improve his image, his political image, there's one thing in particular he should do. What is it? A, lose the MAGA hat. B, get a dog. C, smile more. Lauren Blanchard. Let's get a dog. He won't get do it, though. a dog. Is it get a dog? He should get a dog. How would I look walking a dog on the White House lawn? Would that be... <laughs> Feels a little phony, phony to me. A lot of people say, oh, you should get a dog. Why? It's good politically. I said, look, that's not the relationship I have with my people. <laughs> okay. Can we just check to make sure my button's working? <laughs> <laughs> All right. our, actually, our producer has... Lauren Blanchard's streak has been so... I'm not going to say controversial, but so unusual. Yes. Not missed a single question that our producer, Justin Wells, has come down from New York to supervise. And I'm not making that up. I feel better having him this, here. He's here. He's All here. Right. It's unbelievable what she's done. Okay, question three. Speaking of dogs, the 143rd Westminster Dog Show was held this week. A Wire Fox Terrier won Best in Show. What is his name? Lauren. It's King. And the reason I know that is we have a wire fox terrier, so my mom sent out <laughs> a text message about it this morning, I'm making sure we knew my that this.